you mentioned that uh, your parents were immigrants from Ghana. I guess I wanted to start by asking about your early life growing up in Baltimore, your home life, what your parents did for a living, and what originally motivated you to become a scientist and a physician. Yeah, it's it's great. I was um, I was in a talk in in Beijing. Um, about, uh, I guess now, a year and a half ago uh, with the chair of their brain and cognitive uh, sciences department. And I, I was telling him how uh, my dad, who uh, came over for Ghana, he came over for undergrad at MIT uh, and then did some graduate work there and did a, a business degree. But I, I, I joke with him there. I, I told my dad I was going to meet this guy. He said, oh, you should tell him that MIT is very near and dear to you because we lived in campus housing. So you should tell my dad, you know, he's, a, he's an interesting set of humor. He said, you could tell exactly the building you're conceived in right so uh, i was uh, sort of like born in <laughs> funny enough i ended up in academia but i was born in academia and my parents moved uh to washington dc um after my dad finished up his uh degree at sloan's business school he was an engineer as well a civil engineer and i grew up in silver spring maryland um and much of the time there, you know, of my, I have an older brother, a younger brother, and then my parents got divorced. My dad got remarried, so I have step siblings as well. Um, and my older brother was a super smart one in the family. And growing up, I had a combination of dyslexia, what we would undoubtedly call attention deficit disorder, and just about every medical illness you could imagine. So I'd spend like months in the hospital in like kindergarten, and I had allergies to just about everything. So school wasn't really my thing growing up. Um, I was good at it, right? Like, but like my best friend was um, the computer. So it was like around the time of PCs. And, you know, in a lot of ways, my family was privileged because my dad was an engineer and, and well-educated, we had a PC in the home. So I spent like all of my time behind the PC, figuring out how to code in basic um, when I wasn't running around in circles. So that was much of like early life for me is like being a computer geek and like halfway of uh, an athlete, a track athlete. <laughs> cool. I, uh, one thing I wondered is whether, especially what given what you said in your last answer about various ailments and things, whether you were ever discouraged from pursuing a career in science or in medicine, and, and if so, how did you react to that? How did you overcome that? Yeah, quite quite the contrary, in fact. So my mom is a nurse. Um, and so when you appreciate that, you sort of realize how a, a nurse and an engineer give rise to me, right? And so I, I wasn't interested in pursuing a career in uh, medicine at all. This was like mommy's dream <laughs> was for her son who loved computers to go off um, and be a doctor. And in fact, I, um, I, I entered an undergraduate program that was thought they, they really wanted folks to get on, go on and get a PhD in the sciences. And so I went in with an interest in chemistry. Um, I love physics and math. And so I sort of got super interested in chemical engineering. And it was only in my last semester of undergrad that I decided to go to medical school because I learned about brain machine interface. And I was like, I have to understand how this stuff interacts with the body if I'm going to be sticking chips in people's heads. So I went to medical school on a last decision sort of whim, took the MCATs. And I was actually in medical school before I realized there was a such thing as residency <laughs> that you had to do <laughs> after medical school. So medical school was quite the discouraging experience. As an engineer, uh, we were taught never to memorize things. And so medical school was awful. And I was more discouraged in medical school than I ever was thinking about going into it. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, that should be a lesson <laughs> to people who are thinking about uh, about that. Um, a, a question uh, is: is who are some of your most important influences and mentors have been, and how have they uh, shaped you in your approach both to science and also to activism? Yeah, so I, I, I'll, I'll sort of frame this whenever I give a, a personal talk, I always um, orient it around two people because I think it helps a lot uh, to frame how I how I think about science more generally um, and um, how I think about the importance of the human condition in science, right, both people and differences. So one of them is uh, Freeman Rabowski. 
Freeman Roski is the president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He has been for 20 X years. He became the president around 43. And he got together with a philanthropist in Baltimore and the philanthropist in Baltimore, Robert Meyerhoff, um, realized that there just weren't like black men in the sciences. So he basically gave money and they got together and they're like, we're gonna create <laughs> black scientists and engineers. And um, in the, they created the Meyerhoff program. In the second year, uh, they invited uh, women to join the program. In the eighth year, my year, they opened it up to all folks of all backgrounds and experiences wanted to go into science and medicine. Um, so I, I, Freeman was an important influence because I really had no idea what a PhD was, let alone thought about getting one, but he set up this ecosystem where it um, suddenly became the norm. And in my last year in undergrad, I had a bunch of hobbies because I get bored easily. So I um, ran track all the way through. Um, but in my last year, I was actually student body president. And so what this meant was I got a really up close and personal view of uh, Freeman's leadership. And um, still to this day, um, it is unusual if a week goes by and he's not like, I watched a talk or I watched a presentation. I'm proud of you. Keep up the good work. You have to make the world better for everybody else. Keep it going. So he's played an important role in that. And I, and I say all of that to say, when you look at the Meyerhoff program now, it's a number one producer of uh, people getting in Black people getting MD PhDs in the country, uh, two to one over Yale. So it's the number one by far. But when I started in its eighth year, you can appreciate that like the amount of time it gets to get a PhD, nobody had one. So I basically marinated in an arena where people decided they were going to totally transform the face of science. <laughs> and I watched that happen. Um, the second one was um, when I got to Duke, I joined the lab uh, from a scientist, Miguel Nicolelis, who um, was working on connecting robotic body parts to the brain. And um, during one of my first meetings, he said, I'm going to make a paralyzed person walk again. And I, I come from a religious background. So this seemed a little bit grandiose. This sort of thing hasn't been done in 2000 years. But <laughs> I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, like who says stuff like that? And, you know, lo and behold, at the 2014 World Cup, a paralyzed person kicked the opening kick, right? So I've sort of been marinated um, as an adult and as a scientist in arenas where you just like shoot for the moon and you just stick to it and you go for it over time. And I think in a lot of ways, who I am as a scientist and who I am as a leader and as a mentor is reflected at the intersection of that. <laughs> Very good. So Miguel was an important influence as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, so so uh, related to these these two influences, uh, and I'm sure you get asked all these questions all the time. And I'm sorry for for repeating them, but no. they're the ones that come to mind. Uh, you're 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 a role model and a national spokesman in, in incredibly high demand. And so the question is, how do you balance your commitment to your community and your broader societal goals with your responsibilities and commitment as a physician and a scientist and a mentor to your own students and postdocs? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't think those things are independent, right? So one of the, in, in my last year, one of the things I did that has really shaped and transformed my career, and I, I would recommend it for, um, I read, I do it with all my postdocs, I would recommend it for junior faculty as well. Freeman and I read a business book together, uh, and it was Jim Collins' book, Built to Last, right? And what they do in the book is they basically take a series of companies, pairs of companies, and they compare um, those have, that have done really well, and then those have done extraordinarily well, right? And they try to figure out what the difference is in the companies. And, and one of the things, he talks about in this book is what he called the visionary company. So the companies that did extraordinarily well, um, they actually didn't make choices most of the time, right? So he called this the tyranny of the or. So there are companies, right, that start with saying, do I do this or this, right? And then the other companies say, well, this and this is important. They decide A and B is important. So they put all of their energy into figuring out how to do A and B. Right. And it turns out if you, you sort of appreciate that there's like a cost of making decisions and that cost isn't much more costly than figuring out how to do th two things at once. So almost all of the orientation um, in my lab is how do we do both things and let's figure out what systems are necessary to achieve all of that, because I think they serve each other. Right. I'm a mentor. Um, I, am, I actually um, in my last uh, contract when I finished residency, there's an item in there. It's built in that I go to my undergraduate campus. Campus and I send a day on campus mentoring students. So I mentor students at UMBC in the office um, once or twice a month and I travel up there. 
And at first it was a really altruistic thing to do. I wanted to give back. Um, and so I was sitting in the office one day and you know, the recruiting folks came in from Harvard and UVN and everything else. And it occurred to me that they were coming in and like snatching talent away that should be in my lab, right? So this, this altruistic endeavor suddenly became, you know, the same sort of strategy that I've watched Coach K use at Duke and Nick Saban use at Alabama. You're like, wait a minute, if I recruit the talent first because I'm sitting here, it's both an altruistic thing, but it's a really smart thing to do. So uh, in, in many ways, I think like that, right? How can I serve two purposes at once? And when it comes time for the students to make choices, they're sort of like choosing between the person who's mentoring, who's mentored them for four years versus, you know, the new institution. So, yep. So you, you, you managed to kill two birds with one stone. Always, always. Um, so you mentioned businesses, and I thought it might be interesting for people uh, to hear about uh, your involvement with the African American Neuroscience Research Initiative, uh, what you're doing in that, and, and what you hope to accomplish, since it sounds like that is something at the interface between academic science and, uh, and a business environment. Yeah, no, that this has been um, just a remarkable endeavor for me that I connected with about a year ago. And, and certainly I know uh, Viviana is watching. I want to thank for thank thank her for all of her help in, in advocating uh, for a more equitable neuroscience framework as well. So I was giving a talk at Hopkins. I gave this talk and I'm sitting um, in Dan Weinberger's office, uh, who's at the Lieber Institute, which is associated with Hopkins. And we're having a conversation. As you all can see, I do genetic modeling. So I create mouse models of neuropsychiatric illness. I take human genes and I put them in mice and I study them. And we're just talking about um, the genomic architecture and ancestry. In other words, um, where genes came from and the, the context of genes really matters for how genes are encoded and expressed. And as we were talking, right, I've been excited for a long time about these fantastic studies in uh, schizophrenia and, um, and depression and Parkinson's and, and Alzheimer's and the risk genes that are coming up. Um, I've read these studies about you know, 50 to 100 times. It never occurred to me that there was no one of African ancestry in any of these studies, right? And so if, if you look, um, you know, I don't like using the word exclude, but you know, I, I sort of do math and <laughs> it's really hard by chance to have zero out of a hundred thousand, right? Um, and, and the reasons why these choices are made, but you can certainly appreciate, right? I mentioned, I have family members with severe mental illness and it was pretty clear that, you know, I was sort of operating in an enterprise using genes um, that were found on European ancestries and primarily focusing my research enterprise around these genes. And this is really important because as people look at the polygenomic, in other words, multiple risk locus architecture, if you take these polygenomic scores that you can find on uh, individuals of, your, of, of cohorts of European ancestry, they actually don't extrapolate, right? So they don't work on other ancestries um, at all um, or not well. And, and so this was a particularly important thing for me to bridge. So I was talking to Danny about this and he said, or Dan, and he said, this was something that we're interested in working on. He'd been approached by um, a Baltimore civic leader, uh, a, a pastor there of the Historic Union Baptist Church that has a long history now advocacy. They are actually there at the founding of the NAACP. And um, he'd learned about this differences in genetics as, um, and sort of what, was likely to happen with the precision medicine efforts if this gap <laughs> wasn't closed. And then he and Danny, uh, Dan had worked together to both uh, approach uh, a guy, a, a guy who's pretty wealthy <laughs> um, doing investments in Baltimore, Eddie Brown, who committed uh, some initial seed money. And then they approached the governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan, and got um, uh, some money to support this as well. And so what they had essentially done was they had brain banks that included about 700 brains of African ancestry. And they're just going to ask the fundamental question, are the differences in gene expression um, across different ancestries? And when I heard about this, I was like, one, I have to be involved in this immediately. You know, he was sort of pitching it to me. He's like, well, you know, I don't I know, you know, you don't have a whole lot of connections with Baltimore, but we'd really love to get you involved. And I, I sort of pointed out that I went to school five miles that way. <laughs> and not only that, my sister-in-law is the Baltimore Health Commissioner and my brother lives a mile that way. So <laughs> I have a lot of connections um, with Baltimore. Um, but 
it was it was a really important thing for me, particularly sitting with the Brain Initiative, right? And thinking about you know the really important work that uh, Viviana is doing in terms of creating tools and technologies that can cross the blood brain barrier. Thinking about this next set of tools where you can get proteins expressed uh, based on gene expression profiles in cells. I was like terrified that the Brain Initiative was rapidly careening to a place where there are going to be tools and technologies that only worked on brains of certain ancestry. So this is an opportunity to bring more diverse ancestries into the work uh, that's being advanced on the brain initiative around human cell atlases and make sure that that is more broadly represented. So again, I think this is a this is a, a example of where A and B are the same thing. Both choices around the advocacy and the neuroscience and the mental health enterprise all come together in the same enterprise. Very cool. Uh, I have a question here uh, from uh, an undergraduate. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about your transition into medical school how that experience is tying into your research. I'm a student who's interested in neurobiology research, but unsure about the path beyond undergrad. Yeah, so I, I always say my career path is descriptive, not prescriptive. Um, and, and so I could tell you what happened for me. It's harder for me to give advice to others because I had the most um, uh, difficult transition into medical school one could imagine, right? So I mentioned I was an engineer by background, convinced that you were never supposed to memorize things. Um, and our professors could tell on tests when we were memorizing things rather than deriving first principles. So I got to medical school and I thought, you know, because I really care about my classmates, I spent a lot of time educating them that they shouldn't be memorizing things. They should be learning first principles in biochemistry, uh, genetics, and cellular biology, all which we took in six weeks. And for some of them, it was a review. For me, it was the first time taking it. While studying for the first exam, um, which I clearly failed, um, I, I got some checks in the mail, uh, some canceled uh, checks or some bills that the first one was about 1500 at Best Buy and then like you know 2000 at Lowe's. And they all had a driver's license number on it. That was clearly not mine because I did not uh, have a driver's license in North Carolina. And so my identity got stolen my second week of med school and someone charged about $35,000 to my name. <laughs> so so okay, clearly there's this moment where I'm sitting there like, man, like I love computers. I don't really know what I'm doing here in medical oh. school just because I'm trying to understand brain machine interface a little bit more. This seems like a tough ask. And I mean, I, I remember this one day, you know, I, I, I like, Medical school is hard on its own, let alone trying to deal with identity theft. You know, identity theft happens more often now. Back then, it was like there were not systems to set up. You had to spend two or three hours a day on the phone with each credit card company uh, so that it didn't ruin your credit in your life forever. Um, and to put this in perspective, there was thirty thousand dollars charged to my name at the time. My stipend was seventeen thousand dollars. <laughs> so I, I just remember the day I got in a car, I drove up from North Carolina just to clear my mind, and I ended my drive uh, in. Owingsville, Maryland, on the front porch of Freeman Robowski, um, just talking about how difficult the time was. And we essentially just sat there and talked for like three hours. And he was like, look, I trust you. You're good. You will figure it out, but you have my full support in anything you wanted to do. And the next day, I just drove back and kept plugging away at it, right? So I, I, it, again, my, 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 I present this in a way that is descriptive. I think it's easy to look now into what my career has turned into and assume that there isn't all of these monumental failures <laughs> along the way. But I think it's really important just to fail forward, right? Like pushing boundaries is associated with learning how to tolerate an incredible amount of failure. And for me, the lesson in that was making sure uh, and learning that it was so important to have a mentor that was affirming because life will bring all of the critique that you need. So I try to be a mentor that's like super affirming and supportive and that allows people to push boundaries. That's great. Um, uh, Viviana just writes, thank you, Kat, for showing us where we need to get in a way that one cannot not help or care. So very appreciative as, as am I. Um, here, here's a question I was thinking of that um, might sound a little paradoxical, but uh, in, in thinking about all the issues that we deal with in science, uh, on the one hand, scientists pride themselves as being open-minded searchers for truth. And we typically run diverse laboratories with international students from all over the world. Question is, does that make it easier for you in your fight to make the biomedical research enterprise more diverse and inclusive? Or are there aspects of racism that you find paradoxically are actually harder to identify and overcome in science than in other features of human endeavor? 
Yeah, right. I mean, so there are lots of things about science that are, you know, we we like love controlling variables, right? And we love a re reduction. Um, and we love the idea of, you know, it's always fascinating as a neuroscientist and psychiatrist because we love believing that we're objective, right? And like, we're not subject to bias at all where we know the brain like literally just doesn't work like that. And there's a whole bunch of evidence in other fields, right? I, I think what is so challenging, particularly around the question of diversity when it comes to race um, and ethnicity is that as a scientist, it's easy if you have this fundamental belief that the entire system is based on merit, right? That then the outcome reflect, the output reflects the input, right? And so if you as a scientist have never trained uh, across from somebody who's particularly African-American at any point in time in your training, um, and then you don't in, encounter anybody in, you know, in your application pool, it's very easy. And you assume that science is meritorious because it is certainly meritorious within groups, right? So within groups and situations, there is merit. What that merit is not like equally distributed across groups in the experience. It's just sort of how the United States works, right? So if you've been built and framed in a context of merit, right, and you've experienced that, then you think that the system re reflects that. And so what you ultimately end up pushing against uh, when you're navigating uh, diversity issues, particularly with uh, diversity from inside of this country, you're having to push back against this idea that um, science actually isn't, hasn't reached this optimized meritorious state because of factors that are built all throughout the system, right? And then reflect the current outcome. And, and certainly it's, it's indeed the case, right? Like, we pick reviewers and go to meetings with people in our field because we believe bias is a thing, right? Like, we, like undoubtedly, right? We, we have camps in neuroscience because of, you know, that, that are ideas based on your mentors, mentors, ideas, right? That are, are passed down to us and, and we plant our flag in them, right? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll even say, you know, certainly, I, I try to be humble and acknowledging even even this funny, simple little thing that I said, we would never believe that an inbred human is a good model of human emotional function, right? right. But we believe that inbred mice are, right? It's these That's little right. thematic things that like, when you say it like that, it's like, yeah, that is sort of strange, right? Why do we even argue that? Um, but it's because we have been enculturated to, to think that way, right? So I think it's really important for scientists to appreciate there's a lot of enculturation and bias that's built in what we do. And um, it's good for science in terms of our innovation to learn to push against that. But we need to push against that more broadly, both in terms of thinking about how talent arises in this country and how we can thrive within the current system. Great. Thank you. Uh, some more questions that have come in. <clears throat> what was a challenge of any that you faced earlier in your early in your career that would be surprising for us to know? I mean, you've already told us about your identity getting stolen in medical school. That's pretty surprising. But, uh, are there are there any other uh, and any other things that uh, challenges or or failures that you have that you know you would caution those who would follow in your footsteps uh, uh, not to make, even though failing is important for getting ahead. Yeah, well, I, I have a high tolerance for failure, right? I'm sort of like, and it, it, it's fascinating, right? My mentors have learned to build in so much affirmation that it gives me an incredible space for risk taking, right? So I push a lot of boundaries because I'm so affirmed by my mentors, right? And when you push boundaries, like stuff goes catastrophically wrong all of the, like all of the time, right? Aside from ending up in medical school, not knowing what residency was. Um, I tried to drop out of medical school a couple of times and people weren't in their offices the days I tried to drop out, right? I tried to drop out of residency a couple of times, like, right? So I, I'm not opposed to like, like being reorganized at key points in time, right? I mean, I had the early experiences of, as that many scientists do when you work on a paper or grant and some of my early grants, the, the comments were like, we're not sure if this is this guy's ideas, right? And, and like trying to navigate this stuff. Still to date, the best grants that I have written have never been funded, <laughs> right? Like, so there's, there's a lot of wow. that that is, there's a lot of that that's just intrinsic, right? I mean, I, I've reached a point where my ideas have penetrated more, but I mean, there were the early days when 
the comments would be, why would someone ever record that many brain areas, <laughs> right? Um, before the field thought about integrating that much, right? The, the idea of figuring out how to navigate this idea of causality and simulations being super physiological and how to put it all together, right? You know, as I was developing um, this framework that, I, that just was very natural for me as an engineer, this framework of thinking about how the brain was organized, that's when like the stimulation, the cell type specific simulation tools were taking off, right? And so I was essentially going in a, a way that was orthogonal in a lot of contexts and figuring out how to navigate, like not being laughed out of the field. <laughs> so all of these things have been really sort of critical in, in learning how to na navigate them and tolerate that. There are obviously the natural things, um, and I've written about some of this um, in my writings of just like, like I notice I'm different in the readings that I go into. There's just no doubt about it, right? Um, and learning how to navigate some of that, right? Um, and, and everything to figuring out how to navigate both being different as an engineer um, and that different other that perspective, but then the unique uh, individual experiences. So, you know, like it's, as I'm thinking about like federal initiatives, for me, I'm like, well, how are we gonna get more diverse talent in, right? Cause it's equally as a priority as the science and how are we gonna think about like computation and how are we gonna prioritize that to the equal amount? And, you know, like most things are, set up to make sure individual voices are represented, but not over people with a different set of experiences, right? It's sort of like 29 is greater than one or 40 is greater than one. So just figuring out how to be different um, in arena and hold my ideas. And, you know, I like people a lot. So that really helps because I like my colleagues like a lot, <laughs> right? And so having some patience around that, but it, I mean, it's a challenge. It's a challenge being and thinking differently. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Uh, here's, here's a, uh, comment from one of our faculty, Cindy Hagen. Uh, she says, I love your appreciation for fostering a growth mindset in your students. What additional advice would you give to first generation college goers who may or may not know or appreciate the path towards graduate level education? Yeah, so I, I bring undergrad students and high school students into my lab all of the time. And I have a lab meeting. And um, I stopped the last meeting and I asked them what they understand and what they think about what's being presented. And this is for two reasons. One, if we're going to do team science, um, people on the team need to be able to communicate in ways that other people dis in disciplines have. And so those that know nothing about the science are the most useful gauge. But then secondly, I also point out that the person that is likely to be most innovative if we communicate it in a basic understandable framework is the person who's never seen it before, right? So the longer we're in a field, the more thinking becomes flexed or fixed right? And the most innovative person is going to be the person who has never thought about it at all. So I even build into this idea that sometimes the basic scientific experience is going to be in the high school student or the, um, the undergrad who is sitting in the lab at the same time. As, as, as uh, David will tell you, I was totally obsessed with thinking about how to bring younger students into the brain initiative, because this has been most of my experience in the lab, right? I'm sitting there having a conversation and, you know, a high school student asks me the question and I'm like, yeah, that's like a lot how I think about it. And it's really hard to convince people in later sets of their training that this just makes total sense, right? So um, I, I think a lot about how to make people more comfortable with sharing their ideas in the arena. That's great. Um, uh, one thing that uh, I, I, I was struck by in, in the writings of yours that, uh, that I read is that you, you put a lot of energy into thinking about different strategies to address the discrepancy in NIH grant funding for black versus white applicants. And I wonder if you could update us on the status of those efforts and whether there is any plan that is currently under consideration at NIH. Yeah, so and as, as you can appreciate having watched the talk, I put a lot of strategy in a lot of things, right? So I'm an engineer and I'm, I'm super analytical and, you know, I, I wish I can turn my brain off, but it like never goes off. And I'm obsessed with numbers and strategy and models and, and complexity. Um, and so um, to, to the question, um, there was a study that was um, published in 2011. And what they did was they basically took uh, NIH funding across the architecture uh, for R1s. This has subsequently uh, been shown to still uh, be the case, um, but you can see this in R21s as well, um, the smaller research grants. And what they found was that if you were a black scientist, um, even after controlling for uh, making sure you came from the same university, same publication record, same number of awards, you were less likely to get the research grant compared uh, to your non-African American uh, colleagues. And what this ultimately translated to, uh, if you counted it out, you basically had to apply for twice as many grants 
to get the grant. And, you know, we can all sort of appreciate um, how painful it is to write twice as, as, as many grants. And so I, I've been thinking uh, for a long time since this was identified, you know, part, part of the NIH strategy, it's thought a lot about how to um, mentor black scientists um, in a different way and mentor diverse scientists more broadly in, in the system. Um, it's put a lot of energy and effort into studying and trying to understand the differences um, that lead to this and what are the key variables. And the point I made there is that it is certainly the case that like primary education is challenging in this country, right? We're sort of, we're like what 34th in the world in terms of math. This is like even worse uh, for folks from diverse backgrounds. Um, college is bad, right? Like what, like 30, 25% of Americans get a college degree, right? Um, less than that, get a PhD. You basically got individuals who are black through all of that <laughs> and that they're at, at the end, right? It is an emergency to capture the fact that there's something built into the system um, that brings harm into to these individuals. And we have to do it immediately, right? Certainly if we want um, additional role models for younger folks to look in, up to, to think they have a space, this is exactly the, the thing you wouldn't um, want to persist. And so you can quantify that. This is, it ends up being um, relatively fixable, right? Out of the 27 institutes and centers at NIH, if they each funded um, one additional R1 per year uh, and an R21, uh, this would be closed off. So one can estimate the value of that. This is um, loosely estimating the value of an R1 at $3 million. As you get more, more senior, like David, they tend to be a little more than that. But over five years, uh, I think $3 million, um, about a third of that being for indirect cost. And so at 25 grants at $3 million is $75 million. Over 10 years, it's $750 million of underinvestment, right? So that's the starting point of underinvestment only in Black scientists, not thinking about how to diversify the workforce more broadly only in black scientists. So NIH is, is thinking about how to address this. Um, they've launched a new program. It's called the FIRST grant, NIH FIRST. And the idea is to encourage universities across the country to hire more diverse faculty to um, from to and NIH is basically paying half the startup costs and you have to compete for it uh, to get a, a number. And of course, Caltech should be thinking about applying for these grants too. Um, and, um, but what's important is that the investment in this grant, for one, it is not targeted to addressing the additional issue, right? So it's for folks of all diverse backgrounds and those interested in making uh, diversity, increasing diversity in the sciences. Uh, so it's not targeted. Um, I don't think that's a problem. I think it's important to address that part of the system as well. Um, and then it's also $240 million over 10 years, right? So we're saying $750 million of underinvestment specifically in black scientists and 250 $40 million of investment um, going forward. And that gap uh, that I described in Black Scientists still haven't, hasn't been closed, so it's growing, right? Um, and so a lot of people have been thinking about this, have been working on a new piece, uh, hopefully it'll come out soon. It's uh, with some former uh, leaders in academia and in NIH really outlining what our country needs to do to address that issue um, and think about diversity in the sciences more broadly, the type of investments that our country needs to make. And I'm hopeful about this. The new administration has asked all the federal agencies uh, to identify systemic racism in their system and how to address and root it out. So. I think um, it, it, the community is at a place, the, the neuroscience community um, and the scientific community is at a place more broadly where we've realized, um, one, um, this is like not right and fair, right? But secondly, it's also like not super smart, right? As our country becomes more diverse over time to not figure out how to mine the talent in your country, right? This is sort of my Meyerhoff strategy. I figured out how to mine a talent pool and our country's doing an awful job in figuring out how to mine its talent pool. And ultimately this means we're gonna get crushed in the global arena if we don't figure out how to solve this, right? So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this area. Yeah, so, so just following on from that, uh, uh, of course, it makes sense to uh, try to work with NIH as you're as you're doing to liberate more money, uh, but also have some extremely high net worth individuals in this country who are philanthropists, and some of them, like Mackenzie Scott, uh, Jeff Bezos's former spouse, uh, have really uh, made a number of gifts to historically yep. black undergraduate colleges and, yep. and universities. Have you thought about uh, trying to fill this gap that you're talking about, the 240 versus the 750 yep. million by uh, approaching high net worth individuals and looking for private philanthropy and 
And if so, how, how, how would you go about this? Yeah, I, I, I would love an introduction. Uh, please pass on my email <laughs> information. I am, I am always ready uh, to connect and talk about this. As you know, uh, McKinsey Stat made investment in uh, HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities um, to the tune of uh, some of uh, one of them um, in which uh, the African ancestry neuroscience research is connected with to the tunes of tens of millions of dollars, right? So I do think that this is a strategy for addressing this. I think classically people think about the earlier parts of training. Um, and my hope is that as we sort of appreciate um, the impact of COVID-19 uh, that and the disproportionate impact on uh, individuals of uh, Hispanic, uh, Hispanic individuals and black, individ black communities, that one would realize that those that are at the research events, <laughs> thinking about cures and treatments for diseases, that is a really important target that has to be addressed right now. So that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great um, strategy. And again, if there's anybody listening on the call who knows how to make those connections, I am happy to talk to them about the role of those investments in transforming uh, our country. Importantly, as they're funding those undergraduate students, these are going to be the mentors and the role models that those undergraduate students look to. So they play an important role in the system. Great, great. And, and uh, along those lines, I guess, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask is whether there's a particular message or messages that you have for black students and students of color who would like to emulate your success and follow in your footsteps, what would you advise them to do and not to do? Yeah, so first of all, do not follow in my footsteps <laughs> it, and, and, and do not emulate my success, right? Like find your own path in all of it, right? I mean, in, in every way, shape or form, my lab just looks a lot like who I am as a human being, right? And I, I've continued to figure out how to find myself in arenas and find the supports that are necessary for me to thrive in the unique way uh, that I grew up, right? But I, I will give some critical advice on how to learn to be yourself in a system. And um, this, this, and I always put it this way, right? If you wanted to go to, into investments and um, Warren Buffett was willing to meet with you for 45 minutes, um, but you had to go to Mumbai to get, to get this meeting, every single person that was serious was hop on a plane for 45 minutes, right? And um, the one thing that has been the case uh, with my career throughout is that I am passionate about finding mentors, right? And whenever I'm meeting with students, I, I joke about this because I don't mean this seriously, but I always say students need to learn how to stalk a mentor. <laughs> In other words, they have to learn how to make it really convenient for their mentor to run into them everywhere all of the time, right? The, the way I ended up in um, actually doing residency, I, I signed up to do an away rotation at the National Institutes of Mental Health, where um, I was in Carlos Zerati's lab, who was working on one of the new treatments for depression, ketamine. And while I was up there, I just emailed the director, uh, Tom Minsel, and I said, hey, I'm an MD, PhD student. I'd love to talk to you about careers in science. And he emailed me back like 45 minutes later, we had lunch, and he, you know, he, during that conversation, he said, I really think, you know, you're an engineer, you're thinking about brain machine interface, we have a horrible history of psychosurgery in this country. And you should really do psychiatry residency, because then both people should trust you. But then you also appreciate the nuances of human behavior that you won't always appreciate if you were just thinking about pre preclinical models all the time. And I told Tom, I said, it's resonant, it's cool and all, but like everybody has to stop doing research for like four years. And like, I'm like, I'm totally a lab rat. And I wasn't willing to stop doing research for four years to get clinically trained. And so he asked, he said, well, how would someone like you do residency, right? It's this fundamental question of how would we create something that works for you rather than how do you fit into the system? And I said, well, you know, I'd sort of like start my research lab right now and I do residency part-time. And it was like a bit of a joke. <laughs> and Tom was like, oh, that sounds like a really cool experiment. We should do that experiment. And before you know, he like calls, like he's talking to my department chair, the dean of my med school. And I'm like on the faculty and a resident at the same time <laughs> doing huh. something that is solely me. Right. And, and so I think uh, what my career is a product of me figuring out um, and learning that, you know, systems have rules. They always do. Right. Um, but there are those that make rules and can change rules. And so it's really important to find mentors, build relationships with them. And, and certainly, you know, you got to work hard and, and build trust. 
but they will find opportunities to change the system to make it work better for you. And any system that is built for an individual, that individual will thrive in it and do much better, right? So that's the advice that I would give um, all young people is um, spend time with yourself, figure out who you are, figure out what you're passionate about, and then figure out how to find your way into systems um, that will adapt and support you because those in power over the system believe in you and they believe in your inherent potential. Find mentors. <laughs> great, great advice. Um, some, some advice for Caltech. Uh, you know, as I don't have to tell you, we, we have one of the lowest rates of, of uh, uh, underrepresented minorities uh, among our graduate student population, uh, among our peer institutions. And, and so it, 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 it makes it doubly hard to recruit people of color, black students here, when they look around and there are so few people that look like them already at, at an institution. But, feel like because it is small and because people care about each other at Caltech, Caltech could become a place actually where students of color, underrepresented minorities actually want to be yep. because they know they can find a sense of, a, of community. They know they can find mentors. They know they can find people that will take care of them and help them grow. But that's a huge sigmoidal curve to, uh, to get over. Uh, any thoughts about what Caltech could do to sort of turn that around? Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll say this from uh, two fronts. I gave a talk earlier today um, around this idea of changing the arena and changing the environment, right? And uh, I, I think um, Caltech is certainly on the right um, side of this, right? I said, if you believe two things as a scientist, right? If you believe that intellect is universally distributed, right? And yep. um, you believe that you want to be the best institution, then your environment should reflect the population you can sample from, right? If you walked into a company and they told you they want to be the best and they believe that intellect was universally distributed and it was all men, you'd say, well, clearly there's no way you can be the best because you're sampling from less than half the population, right? So um, I, 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 I applaud um, Caltech both in their belief that intellect is universally distributed and also uh, their willingness and interest in becoming the best, right? Um, I will say with regards to diversity, right? Human beings just feel more more comfortable by saying this, right? One of the reasons why the Meyerhoff program worked so well was the cohort model. And so it was a, it's not a, it's not an HBCU, right? It's not a predominantly minority institution, but a group of people came in together, right? That were able to provide a space of sameness as they were going through the experience of navigating things in different ways. While, while I was certainly um, the first African-American to get a PhD uh, in neurobiology at Duke, um, one of the things that had been done by the former Dean of Admissions of the medical school is that out of a class of 100, she would, had already made like 25% of the class underrepresented minorities years after years. And this was before most medical schools weren't thinking about it. So it was the same sort of cohort experience I had in medical school that was absolutely fundamental to getting to the other side. And, and so the question for every institution is, if you want to be the best, right, what is the scale of investment that you put into being the best in other things, right? And universities know how to build buildings and put massive scale of investments into being, you know, the best geneticist or the best neuroscience institutes. Um, do you want to be the best um, overall in terms of human capital as well? Yeah, thank you. Um, Here's another question. I'm not sure the best way to articulate this, but um, what, what message do you have for well-intentioned white colleagues who wanna work for, in science at least, for a colorblind world where everybody is judged by their potential and their talent and their accomplishments without regard to their race or ethnicity, but while still acknowledging the special burden of institutionalized racism that their black colleagues and students carry with them. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I would say that that's not just the goal of um, 
of white my white colleagues that's my goal too right <laughs> like my my goal is actually a system that is based on talent and merit and ideas and potential like that is that is the goal right and we always have to appreciate that science exists in a broader ecosystem right and so um if we want to meet that goal we also have to transform the ecosystem because it's not just the individual scientist that determines that things are meritorious or not right like at a minimum we all send our papers and grants out and they're human beings on the other side and it is it is inherently human to prefer sameness it just is right like there's there's something that that happens when um somebody says well that person reminds me of me and it just it happens right it's a, it's a thing though that, that in some ways makes us great parents right to prefer sameness and, and things that remind us of ourselves and it's inherently human and and that function might not be that much of a problem if power was equally distributed which is not because of history right so i think in terms of pushing towards an outcome where talent and merit and that's all that thrives and that we can be colorblind, it means putting energy into addressing the fact that power is not universally distributed. And most importantly, I have a good friend who wrote an op-ed recently, and she made the point, objects in motion tend to stay in motion <laughs> unless, unless countered by a force, right? right? So these yeah. things don't just change because we stop looking, right? Um, systemic yeah. racism is in motion in the country. It was designed and built that way. <laughs> It's hard to stop once it starts. Yep. Um, exactly. Well, I, I really appreciate all of your answers. I think that uh, we've covered a lot of, uh, uh, of of issues here. Is there anything that that you would like to add that uh, I didn't ask or that didn't get touched on that you would like to leave your audience with uh, before we finish up? Yeah, no, I, I'll just say it again, it's uh, been an honor and a pleasure uh, to be here. I'm so happy and so pleased that our initial conversations uh, last summer have grown into this. I'm, I'm really excited and I know I've got some uh, good things to report to a, a young trainee in my lab about the work that you all are doing. So <laughs> Great. Thank, thank you, Cap. And, yeah, and, and absolutely. On that note, uh, on that note, I just want to let everybody know that this series, Diverse Minds, although it was originated in a neuroscience institute here, this is something that institutes on campus across many different disciplines have now signed on to. And so this is not just a neuroscience series. This is a series that is going to bring in speakers across the scientific spectrum. And our next speaker is going to be on April 28th. Uh, Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. She's a marine biologist and a policy expert and a writer, and she's being sponsored by the Resnick Institute for Sustainability. Uh, and so that's going to be the next installment in this. And uh, Kath, I can't thank you enough again for, first of all, encouraging this program and for kicking it off with a spectacular presentation on both sides of it and uh, look forward to your continued input uh, into what we can do here uh, to make this the kind of place that I think it has the potential to become. Fantastic. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. And thanks to all of our uh, uh, listeners here. Uh, I hope that they've enjoyed this as much as I have. Thanks again. Thank you all.